Welcome to Funnel Reboot, the podcast that shares ideas on how to upgrade your lead generation. Here is your host, Glenn Schmelzley. Hey, Glenn here. Welcome to Funnel Reboot, where we explore how to upgrade our lead generation. This episode, we'll be talking about content, how it belongs to everyone, and a cooperative way to create and use it. But first, I want to invite you to give feedback. There's lots of ways to reach me. You can get me on social media at Funnel Reboot. You can use the form on the FunnelReboot.com site or phone the feedback line at 613-703-7073. I was just overjoyed the other day that uh, I got an email and uh, it was from a person who was saying, I'm writing to say thank you for sharing your knowledge in the podcast. I would say that the episode was made for me at right at this moment in my career, being a solo person between the executive and the sales team has been a challenge for me working to convince them that marketing works properly when we follow the tools and partners that you talk about. So thank you so much. And I encourage you to leave me feedback, both what you like and what you don't like. So let's get to today's episode, a cooperative approach to content. Now, a simple marketing model goes something like this. We have a product that solves a problem. A buyer who has that problem, they find us and they decide it's worth it and a sale happens, right? That sounds great. Yeah, but it puts some big expectations on the buyer. One, that they can feel their unmet need, their problem. Two, that there's a well-known product category out there and that they can find vendors in it. And three, that they can predict the success that they're going to get by buying our product. It's a stretch to imagine a buyer could independently do all of these. Well, in B2B, that's what content marketing has been meant for, to educate prospects and inform them of the solution's value, elevating us, the content's author, in the process. So I guess I could say, relax, marketers everywhere. Content is the answer to your prayers. Content is all you need. What's that you say? You don't have enough content? Or you don't know exactly how to deploy it to get its maximum effect? Okay, in all seriousness, our guest has good news for you. He feels that content can be found internally in our companies. And for those of us who sell B2B type products, he's also full of ideas on how content can be used to draw in those prospects and get them to use and come on side with our products. My guest came to using content for marketing by using content first for a different purpose, training and education. See, content has posed the same challenges in their field as ours. And as they, in training, tried to modernize how to use content, they were trying this is back around the turn of the century, to let people take it in at their own pace, no matter how distant they were from a classroom. He got into this field by studying education and psychology. And that led him to the University of Illinois, Urbana-Champaign, for a PhD. If you don't know, Illinois is practically the American epicenter of large-scale computing. And that brought on the dawn of the internet through tools that were made there, like Telnet and Eudora and the Mosaic Browser. Well, being at this school while all this was going on, he witnessed efforts to take learning onto the internet, built on top of these new browsers. He got in on the ground floor, and a decade and a half later is Senior Vice President of Business Development at a company that makes e-learning authoring software. Let's go ahead and check out what Paul has to say about this new approach to content. Hey, thanks so much for having me today, Glenn. Uh, yeah, my name is Paul Schneider, and I uh, work with Domino. Uh, we are a, a provider of cloud-based collaborative authoring solution, and I'm the uh, Senior Vice President of Business Development. Sweet. Okay, so we'll get into what you meant there by a collaborative solution. Um, but let me, for the sake of people who don't know um, e-learning, uh, 
let's look at your product. Uh, and, you know, we've got marketers here. So marketers always like a good case study. Um, tell me if I've got this right. I think that your product is used by uh, companies that have a learning management system or an LMS. Have I got that much right? Yeah, you sure do. Um, most companies, not all, but uh, most companies do have a learning management system. And it's kind of a central platform that organizations use to you know, provide an area where people can take training, find out about training, sign up for instructor-led training. But it's a way that people can track and organize and, and, and get that information to all their employees and or partners and, and even sometimes customers. Perfect. Okay. So uh, the workers who have a job to do, uh, this is, you know, if we think of them as being students, uh, the LMS is the repository where they're going to get all of their learning. And then have I got this right, that we now can turn over and look at the teachers. No, they're not called that, but you know, somebody had to make the lessons and there've got to be teachers that create the lessons, right? Yeah, that's exactly it. Um, what are they uh, called? Yeah, so um, in some cases they are teachers, although the word instructors is used more in the corporate world. Uh, okay. There's also instructional designers who develop training. And um, at the end of the day, there's all sorts of different training that can be launched from a learning management system. It can be, um, you know, there's all sorts of compliance that people have to take, uh, yeah. diversity, harassment. Sometimes they just buy that as kind of off the shelf, like you'd buy a book, um, if you will, and it's kind of already done. Um, in other cases, of course, they uh, want to teach somebody some things and there's on-the-job performance material support. Or in other cases, um, you have a classroom and it is an instructor, just like a teacher, as you said, teaching it. Of course, they have to develop their curriculum just like teachers do, or they use curriculum developed by other folks. Um, and then more and more, uh, we're continuing to see what we call e-learning or self-paced learning, or at least that being a mix of it. And that's where instructional designers or subject matter experts or folks all working together as a team kind of develop uh, training that teaches those employees about those things specific to the organization. So everyone has their secret sauce and this yep. is a lot of it in their products. And so they need to teach uh, their employees. And like I said, sometimes partners and customers about their stuff. And, and that's where that content comes into play. We call it kind of custom content. Right. Okay. So, and we'll delve more into uh, exactly what they do, but uh, with your tool, but they, as uh, an entity, these instructional designers, I've heard them called IDs. Mm -hmm. um, if we can kind of look at them as a, as a category, I mean, they and even the entire uh, field in which they work, uh, it's not that old a field, right? I mean, uh, if, if we look at maybe the 80s, you know, so we're in kind of a 35, 40 year range where companies really got serious about taking that training and development function and finding people for the roles and then putting the processes and later technology in place for them. Does that sound about right? Yeah, it's certainly been growing and you kind of hit uh, hit it there in terms of timing. I mean, in the past and maybe even earlier than that, though, there were instructional designers, but they were, of course, designing curriculum uh, just as designers might be designing curriculum for teachers to use in classrooms. Because, of course, right. not, teachers don't have to do it all themselves all the time, although I'm sure it feels like that for them some days. But, mm -hmm. uh, yeah, that's been around. And then what you started to see as you know, computers became more revel uh, prevalent, uh, you would have self-paced training. And of course, then when the old internet uh, started to become commercial, then you started to see that being delivered over the internet and moving over uh, different uh, ways to go ahead and get it out. And that's what really started to uh, push that revolution. Right. So yeah, we saw you know the letter E getting affixed to uh, a number of these things that had already existed. So, and I, I gather the backbone of these has been the learning management system. And so, if we uh, think of how your tool works, um, you're not the LMS, but LMSs uh, came around, and uh, as they were connected to the cloud, as they started to be 
uh, used across the entire enterprise. The need for collaborative authoring came along, right? So am I correct that that's kind of the evolution of what led to companies like Domino making products like yours? Yeah, you're you're right on track there. So, I mean, if you think of like an artist, uh, back in the day, they always used paper and pencil or some kind of a utensil there. Not that they don't now as well, but then, uh, you know, tools like Photoshop came out and that enabled them to do more things or you think in the area of special effects and, and media design. Same thing happened in learning. And so as we wanted to have more self-paced learning that uh, folks could take any time there, um, authoring tools or solutions. And um, at first, of course, just like uh, Photoshop and other things, they were all on your desktop. But as the um, access to the internet changed, and of course, we know that everyone can actually do a whole lot more if they can work together effectively. Um, You started to also see cloud-based solutions or hosted solutions, depending on your name and your timing. And that's where uh, Domino came out kind of early in that space and has continued. All right. That makes a lot of sense. Uh, And the, so in relative ages though, um, that still makes it fairly young, right? Because you had to have the cloud and uh, enterprises who had adopted and were really flexing their muscle with uh, LMS systems. So I guess what I'm kind of asking here is, you know, did Domino and its contemporaries find themselves having to make a, a category, make a thing for authoring tools? Uh, because before then, there wasn't necessarily a technology category like that. I mean, didn't you kind of grow up with the category or the category grew up with you? Yeah, it's uh, a little bit more at the latter. I mean, when things and systems first came out, uh, when they came out at the University of Illinois, um, they were, and we talked about LMSs as a separate system, they were kind of all in one because there there wasn't plug and play. It was like you could do one or the other. There was a, a few choices out there. But as that mm. to evolve and grow, um, you did get a few um, authoring tools, which became very popular. Authorware for those folks who have been around for a long time, and and Toolbook kind of became the granddaddies of it there. And um, not long after, other ones started to enter the market, and Domino was one that entered in after that. And uh, was one of the first ones that uh, came out as a cloud tool. And early on, they called those cloud tools almost exclusively uh, learning content management systems because not only did they allow you to author, but they also allow you to manage all that content online and, and work together for the first time, which was really novel. And of course, uh, things, as you might imagine, changed. And like any company, we had to continue to grow and change with it as the industry changed and um, needs changed too. Right. And, you know, you brought in another phrase there, which uh, if we're playing uh, our alphabet soup of acronyms, we've got LCMS, right? For the learning content management system. And like anytime you even add a new acronym, I I think, you know, the very first thing in every uh, marketing textbook you'll find is, you know, they say that the customer has to have awareness. So, you know, to make that uh, group of uh, tools, something that people will buy, you have to first make them aware of it. And then you have to help them uh, see their own needs and applications for it and on and on. So now let's swivel over to these IDs that you've been talking about mm-hmm. who were using, you know, these other tools and then then your realm of tools uh, comes to them. Tell me a little bit about them and what the world looks like to them. Like who do they serve inside of their company? Uh, do they have a very clear cut customer? Uh, do they have a very clear cut, you know, way of spending budget? Tell, tell me about the, the, the buyer. Yeah, so um, that does vary greatly. And of course, it uh, doesn't always directly relate to the buyer either. So instructional designers uh, in uh, the old days, which as you noticed, uh, old isn't that old, uh, mm. really, um, and timing, they often design things and they weren't always the users of these tools, even as those tools came out. 
they would have a team just like you might have a graphic designer working with a marketing team. And then like you might have an SEO um, person working. You, they would have other folks that are working and were programming and setting things up um, originally. So it was a more teamed approach. But of course, at that time, the internet really wasn't as prevalent or allowed them to work um, effectively as a team. Uh, they, they worked right. you know, on different tools. And as it uh, moved on, uh, different tools like Domino continued to evolve and, and empowered the team to work together. But you also see, just like any other uh, area, that there was a uh, kind of clamp down even more on budgets and things. And in some cases, instructional designers were, people would say, hey, why do I need someone who knows this much? Because they cost more. Why can't I just take somebody who's a subject matter expert and turn them into a creator? Because there was tools that would make it easy, for example, to create a PowerPoint and, and turn it into e-learning content, which uh, yeah. anybody who's taken that content knows it's not so great, but that at the end of the day, um, the training was quote unquote there. So it, it met some, uh -huh. you really had an evolution. And of course, uh, you know, just like any marketing material, other things, you put out bad stuff and, and yeah, it works. It checks a box, but you know that the results are going to be diminishing returns and same is true of uh, training. And so we've also seen instructional designers kind of come back in terms of that and seeing the value in what they do. Um, now their skills have continued to grow and more often than not, they are actually ones using those tools. And when it comes to a buyer, yeah, sometimes they are the buyer, but generally they're part of a department. Um, yeah. Depending on how big the organization is, they may be the only one developing content for the entire organization, or they may be one of many folks building that. And um, if they're the only one, they often have that buying capability because, you know, it's a small budget to go ahead and buy these types of tools and solutions. If they're larger, um, and of course, larger is all relative. So if you have uh, two or three for somebody, that's big. But for other people, you know, 200 is big. Uh, in terms of the number of folks building content. And when you get into those size, you're really looking at a head of an HR department or a head of an IT department because it is a infrastructure type solution, even if it is cloud or SaaS um, solution there. So you do get different buyers. And then in other cases, say uh, sales, for example, um, training those salespeople and making sure they're at the top of their game and being effective is critical. And, uh, Sales, of course, uh, kind of drives their own world, if you will, and so does marketing it sometimes. So in, in some cases, they buy the solution on their own uh, so they can meet their specific need and they have that buying authority. Well put. I mean, and I can't help but as you're talking about the recent history, it does seem to loosely uh, lay against how uh, IT departments uh, and IT infrastructures have gone. So I heard you very clearly, and I think of instances where there was a training and development team and they had their own IT function and they were uh, well-funded. They had institutional momentum. And, you know, we look at what they were using. It was probably like a Vax mainframe or something that, you know, maybe came a step closer to the, local area networks and client servers, but, you know, they had a good infrastructure and the glass is always half empty or half full. But when things like cloud came along, I'm sure a lot of those got disassembled. And, you know, what we're now left with is there are still uh, instructional designers who can spearhead things, but they are working across the enterprise and they are trying to use you know, a little project here or an initiative there to build essentially the modern version of what back in the day was simply, you know, a complete department and you could like point to the where on that floor of the company's offices, they actually had a home. Now they don't really have a home, uh, but that function still is a, as important as ever, right? Yeah, it really is important there. Obviously from company to company, how much they value it's going to vary and you know it changes even within companies you'll see ones kind of cut back i mean everywhere every company every department's always being asked to do more with less i mean that trend hasn't uh, dissipated but yeah. then at the same time you know folks are looking at hey not just do more with less but also do it smarter more efficiently 
So they're looking to tools like Domino to help them to be smarter and more efficient and enable them to engage other folks that maybe don't have the expertise um, to design curriculum and content that is instructionally sound, but they do have expertise in their particular area. And then if you can really get those two uh, folks to work together in the industry, call them SMEs or subject matter experts, uh, and get them to work together with those IDs or instructional designers, then you can really be more efficient if you can collaborate on that. And at the end of the day, it's making sure that, of course, all your uh, employees uh, know their stuff and, and know it great. I mean, it'd be wonderful. We could always hire already trained employees, but that's kind of a misnomer and uh, falsity out there. You want to hire folks that are ready to learn um, to go ahead and adapt to your organization. And uh, that's really what it's about. And one of the exciting things about the industry too is they're starting to um, enable the capture of a lot more information and data, which uh, like marketing and, and the revolution that kind of came with uh, analytics and uh, the, the internet and everything else there, it's starting to happen in the training world that, of course, uh, I believe Elite will have the same kind of monumental effect it had on marketing. I, I think you're right with that prediction. And just before we leave the environment that they're in, I mean, I was hearing you say that you've got the SMEs uh, and they're, you know, being sought by these instructional designers and companies and together, you know, by collaborating, they can have a very powerful impact on what the company uh, is able to learn. But I, am I right that out of those two, you know, the SMEs already have a full-time job. So they're maybe being seconded or somebody's just picking their brain for a bit, but these instructional designers, like they have a much harder time doing something without the SMEs help. And yet this is their single job, right? So uh, I, I want to ask about this because I know that Domino is quite intent on elevating uh, the instructional designer and helping them realize just how key they are to things. But is that, would you agree with that distinction that, you know, the IDs kind of have to, you know, produce the meal, but they don't necessarily have the, they don't have the ingredients. Yeah, I mean, that's uh, spot on. So your SMEs, their full-time job is their full-time job when they're being yeah. asked to help folks out and uh, help create training or support uh, folks in there. That's always something on top of, of everything they're doing. Um, and of course, when you do that, it's how can you facilitate and make it easier for the SMEs or subject matter experts to contribute and help out the instructional designers. So, I mean, there's all sorts of ways at Domino. We got a couple different products in there. One that uh, enables them to contribute directly because let's uh, think about all those times as a subject matter expert. We've all been there and we keep getting asked the same darn question over and over again. And because we're nice, or at least some of us are, uh, we go ahead and answer and help out our folks or, or we want to at least be able to help out more. Um, so having tools where, you know, folks like that and us in position, we can easily kind of put out a little note, like, uh, you know, anybody who might have taken out Word and typed in a quick little note, and every time they ask a question, just send that Word file. So it's, how can you make that more streamlined and available to folks where they can discover that content on their own? And, you know, SMEs can actually, do, you know, contribute directly. So they don't have to learn anything uh, specifically in terms of tools, you know, it's just like using Word or using, you know, any other web service, Facebook, you know, to contribute. And then, on the flip side, of course, you know, that's great for little how to's and quickly getting things, but the really understanding processes and stuff, that's where instructional designers, their expertise comes in. They're experts at taking information, distilling it, and turning it into teachable moments, uh, information that can be really learned and understood, and then, of course, executed on. That's where their expertise lies. Um, and of course, some are experts in tools, but, it, you know, using a tool is the easy part of the job. The, the hard part is really taking that information and distilling it. And sure, they can look at PowerPoints or books or something like that. But at the end of the day, the subject matter experts really understand what are the key things. And they also understand, too, where are people stumbling? So you want to have those tools really facilitate, make the SMEs job easy or make the extraction of the stuff in their head easy for the instructional designers. And, you know, that's where you're starting to see 
more and more things with the collaborative tools to really help them out there. So the instructional designers can deliver on that awesome information and where the newbies to the company can take it and really learn and uh, ingest that content. And then, of course, execute on it in an effective and efficient way. Right. And it, it does sound by the suite that you've got that there are many ways for people who've already bought it to uh, make you know some very important progress in their company with how it learns. What about the folks who haven't yet bought the tools? Uh, you have content marketing, which is going to reach that audience and help elevate them and in the same process, bring them along to hopefully buying from you. Tell me how you actually deliver some of the messages you've just given out to those audiences. Where do you put the content? What format is it in? Text, image, voice? What do you use? Yeah, no, that's a great question. And um, like any company, you know, you try to train our own folks, but you, you try to train your customers. And that's one of the I think exciting things from the training area is that uh, marketing and training, you're starting to see more of a meld and marketing's realizing, hey, if I got smarter customers, then they're more likely to buy my stuff um, as well yeah. as uh, use it effectively and uh, have reduction on support costs. Uh, so it all, there's a nice synergy between that. And, you know, if you can facilitate, and that's one of the things Domino tries to facilitate is make it, then you can take content that's good for, one group, you know, and then maybe there's some special things that if you're an employee or a salesperson you need you to know as well, um, have, you know, slightly different versions, but update once and then it gets to everyone. And so we use some of those same things. Of course, we write all sorts of different uh, blogs talking about uh, all different things in instructional design and training and provide those. We also take uh, that material and sometimes use examples, which of course are all built in our own uh, product, just like all our training materials. And then uh, we can publish it and just create static links, of course, provide uh, blogs that tie into that information. Of course, if you update it, then that's automatically updated uh, with those links. And then also, uh, of course, uh, one of our key audiences, as you mentioned, is instructional designers. So several years back, we um, kind of took a riff off of, uh, uh, I don't know, it was, uh, fo folks in cars drinking coffee. That wasn't yeah, exactly the Jerry Seinfeld. Yeah. yeah, Seinfeld one there and uh, started a new one. We call it instructional designers in offices drinking coffee. Um, and of course, <laughs> nice play for the uh, words. Yes, that is idiotic. Um, idiotic, right. Yeah. And that's a great uh, video podcast that we uh, do once a week. And we invite in all sorts of guests to talk about, you know, this is anything in instructional design. It's kind of our way of not only giving back to the, the industry to help elevate the instructional designers, but help them think about things. Because it's not about our product, but at the end of the day, um, everything you learn from that helps elevate people that uh, use our product and, of course, our competitors as well. Hmm. Yep, that's and you are uh, reaching them, you know, where they are. People uh, can, you know, access that on a mobile device. They don't have to be necessarily sitting in an office and yep. at this time of recording, which is late 2020. Very few people are in offices. So uh, you you certainly expanded it. And so the, the contents there, maybe if we could just peek behind the curtain of like how you look at when you are making that content and it needs to be distributed, you know, do you favor more of just come and get it where they are, you know, you publish it and you expect them to find it and maybe opt in to get more of it? Or I know you have a CRM. Do you like select specific companies or individuals and then go outbound with that content and let them know that you have it? Just give me a sense of that. Yeah, um, like all folks, we do a multiple things to bring that in. And probably like most other organizations, we want to do more than what we're doing. Um, it's just a matter of uh, picking and choosing and bringing those things in and continuing to grow um, just like you would with any particular area in your company. So um, yeah. we uh, have a number of different uh uh, signups or list, you know, we have our customers, folks that have reached out to us and expressed interest. Um, of course, uh, we take advantage of LinkedIn, Facebook, Twitter, and I mean, you know, social media push those things out. 
Um, of course, we also, not not so much this year, but in the previous years and hopefully in the future, I've gone to different trade shows and then, of course, uh, follow up with folks that way and really try to provide them information and in all these different areas that is useful to them in, in their roles, which are all kind of related uh, to the things we've been talking about. So um, some of it, of course, is uh, very much tied to specifically things that we're offering or doing, but that's never a majority of it. Um, and there's another good chunk of content that is all about sort of different things that they should be thinking about. And not surprisingly, we're pretty darn good at some of those things they should be thinking about. And then, of course, yes. things that are a little more uh, generic or general, no matter um, what kind of solution you use, which, of course, the uh, instructional designers in offices drinking coffee is that. I mean, it's a, a sponsored by Domino as opposed to kind of a branded email or information that we're sending out. But we do try to send a, a variety of that content kind of along that spectrum uh, so folks are getting something that is useful every time through their email. And of course, there's some things that are more blanket marketing, if you will, about something or a special you're offering. But, you know, that's a, a less of the rule and more of the exception. OK. All right. And it may be an exception, but they are trying to eventually, you know, get a product like yours and. Once you get them really interested in that content, would you say that there's anything in the way that Domino's Funnel works? I know you have a trial offer that you're trying to actually teach them um, what some of the key steps that they will need to take in order to get your product in. Uh, are, are there any you know pieces of content that you have that help them you know uh, make that business case or check with their IT department to make sure that it integrates. Uh, is there, is there any way that you actually, you know, it's kind of meta, but you know, use the, the fact that you're showing them how to do something and you've also kind of made that into a module too of how you get them onto your product. Yeah, no, um, we definitely do that. So yeah, folks often come in and in this particular space, they, they do want and kind of expect the ability to do a trial so they can sign up for that. They get invited into our system to do that. We allow them to invite other folks in because, heck, it's a collaborative environment. So you might as well get your friends out there and start collaborating if you want to. Um, as they do that, uh, we automatically push out content to them over their trial period um, every few days, giving them just information about the product, but then also how to do certain things, highlighting certain aspects of our solution that are unique or uh, particularly more advantageous to them potentially um, to get them information on how to use it or try out different things. Um, all our uh, training material, which of course is kind of links to that and how to use it in training guides. They're all developed in our own products, which um, you would think is normal in the training industry, but it's not. Uh, we're one mm. of the ones that do that, but we push that all out and, and use our own delivery system. Plus, like one of our products is a community and uh, we have all sorts of how-to articles, et cetera, provided there, and that's pushed right out to that. That's another product they can buy. It's a great way for those subject matter experts to share and push things up. And then we can get that information out to them. But then we also have some more traditional collateral like those brochures that uh, folks want to have uh, because they want to push that up to their executive just to get a high-level overview. We've also developed a um, business case because uh, while for some small folks, they're, you know, got a budget within that credit card budget, other folks, you know, typically are using for a medium or larger size, and maybe they're not doing a full uh, RFP or request for proposal, but they still need to be, can make a business case. And for some of them, maybe the first time they've ever done that. So we have a kind of a PowerPoint, PowerPoint deck because of course that's what people are used to there. Um, so they can go ahead and take that information. We give them a lot of starting points for making their business case. It, it's great. I, it, you've said, yeah, you, you have one of everything, but um, I've seen firsthand that, you know, you are using, the learning materials and the subject that the learning materials happens to be about is how to get into this software so that you can be delivering good value to your own internal stakeholders. So, you know, while someone may at some point grab that brochure or, 
you know, actually have to go through the filling out of a templated business case. Uh, I have to say from my perspective, you guys have nailed it with having something that uh, takes someone through what they are having to master to succeed in their role. And in the course of doing, they end up buying software. It's not so in your face. Yeah, and that's, um, I'm glad you kind of noticed that. And that's one of our goals, Ben. And that kind of, as I said, one of the cool things about training is in the past it was, hey, I'm developing training for those folks so they can learn and be done. But now you're seeing, oh, wait a second, I got these partners that sell our products. Um, what if they were smarter about our products? How would they use it? And of course, they need that and maybe a variation of it that's unique to them. And then you're like, uh, well, what about my customers? Well, if they were smarter about the, uh, they'd be able to make better decisions. And of course, we could help shape that a little bit. And uh, we are the better solution. You know, that's uh, obviously everyone believes that. So it's kind of using that material in all sorts of different ways because and the nice thing is with this approach, you can make those true electronic responsive documents that everyone can take it instead of your traditional PDF and, and see all that material. And as you said, they're kind of along the way, they're going, hey, wait a second, um, I want to be able to do this too. And of course, it was built right in the tool. So they're starting to see that. And we make that material also available that right when they're in the tool, they can download and bring in. And then one of the things that uh, we've done just recently is we said, hey, when you're actually in the tool, wouldn't it be great if you could immediately access the help on all those different things and those great articles and and, and uh, material was more readily available right from there? In other words, anticipate your need. And so we've integrated those solutions together. Um, so again, we can easily push that out. But even better, it also makes it uh, easy for our uh, support team to more easily adapt to questions that are coming in. So if there's confusion about something, then they can easily update some material without having to go through, you know, your normal IT development process, which no matter how efficient you are, there's always different steps that you have to go through. But if you can push things through quickly, that's information and updates, well, heck, you can go ahead and take advantage of that uh, capability right away. And of course, your customers benefit. Yes. And SaaS companies, at least anybody who's listening to this, who's who works at one, that marriage of uh, marketing and support and the fact that the information can be used by both, you know, you hear it under the heading of success teams. It's a wonderful thing. And it, it sounds like so long as there's commitment to actually getting that in that material authored, then, you know, both will win and you can, you know, really get you know, two for the price of one. Um, if you wouldn't mind telling me the, if we look internally in terms of who you have to serve uh, with this work, you know, is there a, there's a sales and marketing team. I, I'm sure you have maybe different labels, but when we look at this, the, the folks inside of the company who have to create this content and the folks who are really benefiting from it, just, there's, there's a lot of material. And so I'm interested in hearing from you, uh, what did you as head of this area have to do to argue for the, the time or expense of being able to provide this information in a way that is going to actually uh, wrap itself around the sales funnel? Yeah, that's a great question. And of course, uh everyone's faced with uh budgets restrictions time sometimes oh, no I, I i'm sure you all yeah. you had to do was ask and you just got a huge team of writers right exactly i know just hand it up to you <laughs> <laughs> but uh no we were the rare ones that get that no but seriously um yeah at the end of the day the way i've kind of always looked at it and this is uh from early on when i was in grad school i always thought you know what when i do this I'm going to make some money off it or I have this accomplishment. But what could happen if I could go ahead and reuse it once? That's pretty good. And I really said, well, if I reuse three, number three is gravy. And so my goal always was, how could I go ahead and take something and make sure I set myself up to be able to reuse it two, three, or more times? Because I knew the payoff is not really that first time, but it's the second, third, and then on. So as you kind of look at this content I've said before, is like, hey, how could it help out different folks? So as we looked at things from an internal strategy, but in the sales strategies, 
how could this material not only benefit our sales process, but then also potentially benefit existing customers or benefit specific marketing aspects or tie into what our partners are wanting to do and benefit both companies. So, you know, there's not always 100% overlapped. But how can you go ahead and our tools kind of allow for that partial overlap, but, you know, that update once, uh, push out to many type uh, reuse type models. But how can we go ahead and, and target multiple audiences so we're all benefiting? And then, of course, you start to get buy in from different folks. Um, and sure, it's a change, which is always difficult. But uh, then they start to see the benefits and they see that their workload is either decreased or not increased, but then they get benefits that they didn't have before. Uh, so I just have to say, this is a really interesting one because, uh, you know, we're being held more and more to uh, analytics and to be, you know, using uh, our resources in a way that we can almost instantly provide numbers to show that it was a good use of resources. You, you know, for example, if somebody said, um, I want to make our company a thought leader in a space and I want to put uh, you know, this many things out and I want these many people to have noticed. It doesn't sound to me like you took that approach at all. It sounds like you actually just turned it on its head and said, the information has to be made. And whether that information gets used one time or three times or n number of times, the, the bigger that number is, the more worth it it is to create the content. So, you know, Becoming maybe a thought leader is almost a byproduct of it. Becoming a good partner to your downstream channel is another byproduct of it. Being good at support is a byproduct of it. But make the damn information, like put the content together. And once you realize that that content's got that large amount of usefulness, you don't need to use spreadsheets and numbers to prove why you should do with it. You, you know, create it. Yeah, and to be clear, I mean both areas are important, and but uh, when you look at it too, it's you know you're busy doing your job day to day, and you're like, oh, I know I need to get that out. That's going to make that other problem that cropped up that much easier, and kind of putting that extra effort to get over the hump. Um, now sometimes that just means that you advance your organization or your company to where they can go ahead and now tackle the next big problem. But you would have yeah. never got there had you not done that. And yeah, it is essentially exactly what you said there. Now, one of the beauties is, yeah, numbers do matter. And um, of course, you can see all the folks differ starting to benefit. You know, there's some of the numbers behind it. And that's where in the e-learning industry, uh, there's a new standard called XAPI. And it, it really, what it does is it's kind of to marketing, it's kind of Google Analytics, if you will and starts to enable them to start to get that type of information out, which they've never been able to get out before. And um, as standards go, it's new. It's still kind of old. It's over five years old, but standard, mm -hmm. uh, you're a young puppy at that age. But you're starting to see other companies. Domino has been an early adopter and a strong supporter of that kind of out of the box. But um, then that you can start to get that information and really understand where you're being effective, uh, which is really important ultimately. Because as you said, as I said, it's really getting it out to those different areas. Just get a, the, the damn information out, and yeah. uh, you know all those folks will start to benefit from it. But of course, then you you want to know, hey, I'm starting to get all this information out of all those pieces. What's making the most impact? And when I only have a little bit of time to focus on something, where's the area? Where, where should my focus be? So um, just see, like and that's yeah, that that is exactly. And I mean, that is we've been talking education this whole time. But if we even just think about every single one of us in school, it's a feedback loop, right? And the feedback loop is there to judge the impact. And I found that too many times when marketing is trying to do these. I'll call them squishy areas like, you know, content authoring that we find ourselves having to start with numbers to justify whether we do it or not. When mm -hmm. if you just, you know, think common sense, you say, no, we need to do it and we need numbers, but the numbers will be there to inform us on how well it's doing its job, right? How yeah. we can make it better. I mean, it's going to make practical sense. That's where it's like, Hey, 
as they say, reach across the aisle. Thank God our companies aren't like politics, um, at least not as much so. Um, yeah. You can reach across. I mean, chances are your HR or training department and your support department may not have the exact same needs, but there's going to be overlap. And if you can all take advantage of stuff there, get tools in that will help each other mutually, um, you're going to benefit. And then the result is all of those different departments, their game is going to be upped. The quality of stuff. I mean, marketing's known for their stuff looking awesome. Training's not necessarily known for that, but they're known for the material being high quality. You start to put those things together um, right. along with support, having accurate information, put that in there, and then everyone's going to go ahead and benefit from that. And of course, you start to throw in analytics, uh, which uh, marketing knows all about and training in the past has been able to know of, hey, was there a button in a seat? Did they finish it? Did they get a score? Well, now they can start to learn all sorts of different information and perhaps garner uh, some uh, information from uh, marketing in terms of what's really important. Uh, and of course, that's all in a more modern format now. So um, that information can easily be tied into other business analytics. Uh, and we're seeing all sorts of BI tools out there that are being leveraged too, which um, again, they can be part of that solution. Yeah, and it's digital, right? So there's the yep. there's the reuse. You you simply have to change your perspective around. So, and for any product marketer that just wants to catch something really valuable, what Paul just said about taking, you know, don't don't think of yourself as having no content. There's a lot of content that is already resident in your company, and as a marketer, you can put it to use. You just have to change your mindset to realize that uh, you are reusing things that you know, maybe coming, they're, 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 they're in other forms right now, but, you know, look at the absolute substance of it. You can worry about the format that it comes in later. Uh, and like I said, it's digital. Uh, Paul, so you came along in your own journey to uh, finding this industry, finding this company. Tell us a little bit about how you came to be a person who can, you know, evangelize the space and uh, really take the new technology that's out there now and try to show your tribe how it can help them. Yeah. I mean, I came to it a little bit roundabout way. I was always as a young lad, uh, interested in computers and, and what's going on. And of course it was ancient compared to what you see now, but as I moved on and I went to graduate school to get my doctorate, I was studying psychology and Anybody knows psychology and also uh, education, they know that there's a lot of overlap. I mean, in one case, you're focusing on individuals and in the other case, you're focusing on groups. But we're all trying mm -hmm. to learn to be better people, more more informed. Uh, you know, sometimes the purpose is a little bit different, um, but is a very uh, good overlap there. And I ended up uh, at the university being fortunate enough to work with a lot of folks in education at that time. And the fact that I was interested in computers and being around basically the uh, dawn of the internet age when the web browsers were just coming out, I ended up doing a lot of uh, instructional design and curriculum work in that area. And from there, I uh, joined a startup uh, LMS company and uh, they uh, appreciated the fact that I learned like learning new things. And I ended up heading up several different departments and help forming departments and helping them grow um, the organization grow and building those. And of course, then continued on with uh, Domino several years back. And so, um, yeah, that's been kind of the journey for me, but uh, it has really helped me to get a different perspective of all the different pieces that uh, kind of play into it. And, you know, as uh, someone who also has run my own business there, I've kind of gathered the uh, sense of need for the different groups to work together. And if they, they can, um, you really benefit. You talked about, hey, that material may not be in the format you need. Well, I'll I'll be uh, upfront with you. That training department or somebody you reach out to, they may not be happy with that format either. So if you're working collaborating hmm. together, you might be able to up their game, and they will be probably pretty open to it. Um, you know, to uh, open their game to make their material more up to your standards, because uh, that'll help improve them theirs too. So don't hesitate. Yeah, and I mean just. In the way that you've described it, you know, you seem to be hungry for learning stuff, but you're also, you know, interested in, as you say, reaching across the aisle to other people. And you take a really broad view, I think, of 
who all the stakeholders are, right? Customers are one of them, but they are just one of them. And you seem to be able to kind of almost uh, liaise with many different people who in their own function may have a hard time seeing it from another perspective, but you seem to bring that across to them. And I think that that's a, a great thing to have. It makes you sound very natural when you are describing uh, something that is needed by one area, but that another area has uh, to you, it seems to be all one part, a part of one big cohesive whole. Yeah, I mean, it's, uh, as you know, in any company, every, every part of the organization needs to be contributing. And when you get those cases of it's us versus them, and you're all in the same organization, you know, that's where you start to have problems. And uh, when you start looking at training material, I mean, it's not all about training. It's about support. It's about your customers there. And uh, you're all, you know, drinking the same Kool-Aid champagne. Yeah. Uh, you need to be on the same page. And it, it is hard to kind of get out of your um, area of expertise or, or focus. Uh, but when you kind of bring your head up uh, from your desk there and look around, yeah. uh, you start to see, yeah, there's some similarities there. And, you know, at the end of the day, if you can work together a little bit, may, maybe it's a little bit different than your focus. But uh, again, uh, you think of circles, there's a lot of overlapping circles there. And as I mentioned with the marketing kind of design and training, uh, you're going to really end up upping your game no matter which area it is your focus. Um, and then, of course, you know, you're going to have an ally that's going to help benefit your group and their group. Um, which right. And then you get into those multipliers, the second, yep. the third, the nth time you've talked about. I mean, if there's one thing I've taken away from all of this, it's don't get sucked into the turf war. Uh, content belongs to everybody. That, that's exactly it. And uh, you know what? You're going to be better at some aspect of the content and, and vice versa. And just remember that, hey, that that other group probably does have something uh, valuable to contribute to it that right. isn't your focus or something you don't care about. But ultimately, your audience, no matter who they are, probably does care about it more than you think. Fantastic. So, Paul, if someone wants to reach out to you or find out more about the product, where can they go? Hey, just uh, pop out to our website, uh, uh, domino.com. And that's not like the pizza. It's D-O-M-I-N-K-N-O-W. Like I know something and hopefully it'll help you to learn things there. You can also reach out to me directly at paul.schneider, uh, S-C-H-N-E-I-D-E-R at domino.com too. Happy to kind of discuss any of this with you and help you learn a little bit more about our solution and, and maybe how it can help you too. Okay, well, I appreciate that. And we'll have that in the show notes. And thank you for everyone who's listened to the end. I hope you've gotten some good value out of it. If you've liked what you've heard today, please think of somebody that you can share this with. Uh, I know that uh, Paul is, you know, able to take this expansive view. And I'm going to ask you to take a little bit of what that has rubbed off there to let other people know about the types of marketing that they can be doing and give them sparks of new ideas so that they can be even better at what they're doing. So thank you again for everybody joining today. And if you want to get in touch, please reach out to us at FunnelReboot.com or on Instagram or Twitter at FunnelReboot. Thanks for listening. Follow the show on Twitter at Funnel Reboot. If you like what you have heard today, please consider leaving a review wherever you get your podcasts.